Hello everybody, it's me, Ghost Critic. Thank you for joining me to agree, disagree with my personal top 10 comic books of 2018. Now, it was a lot of fun going over the uh, slew of comic books that I'd accumulated over the last 12 months. And it was surprising that I kind of didn't always pick my previous pick of the weeks. Uh, there was a few in there that probably didn't quite make the top slot, but looking back, it was like, no, that was a damn good comic. And it needs to be shouted out from the top of the mountains. So without further ado, I'm going to start my top 10 countdown. Please feel free to comment down below with what would have been your choices. If you've done a top 10 video already or are planning to, please put a link to it in the comment section and I'll rush over and watch that and, and support your videos too. So, here we go. Okay, so we're starting off with obviously number 10 and it is a comic book that perhaps I would have missed uh, and I would have been kicking myself if it wasn't for my fellow uh, YouTube comic book community friends and that is IDW's The Highest House. This is issue number one, the first issue, the one that thrust it into my uh, kind of comic book environment. Uh, written by Mike Carey, drawn by Peter Gross. Uh, this was actually um, a surprise hit for my 2018 pull list. Um, I didn't expect to love it as much as I did, but by God, it was good. Now, the last time I read these two guys collaborating together was on one of my favourite Vertigo series, uh, The Unwritten, which I've always pushed on people uh, and recommended very highly. Uh, so it was going to be interesting to see what they were going to bring to the table next. And what you basically have is a kind of old school fantasy tale. Um, it kind of treaded a familiar path but there was certainly a, a different feel to it. Obviously, we have the larger magazine format. Uh, it felt decidedly European in tone. It, it kind of had that, um, that vibe to it. And given that it was in this, this larger size, this magazine format, uh, what was a, a six issue mini series, despite the fact it just had the same page count as most regular comic books on the shelves today, it felt more like 12 because it, it could expand on its panels and tell so much more story. And it certainly packed a lot of story into those six issues. Uh, it was very historic in feeling, uh, Mike Carey had created a past that was uh, kind of delved into, uh, a mythology of this fantastical universe we were living in. But at the same time, it focused greatly on characters, uh, our main protagonist, our, our cover star there, um, Moth. And, but it also dealt with this kind of minutia of life. Uh, basically a book that can get me kind of wrapped up in the mechanics and the details of roofing. <laughs> That's a winner in, in my books um, and it, it was just a beautiful product. If you did miss out on The Highest House, I do believe it's been collected now in a, a big volume and I hope, because it's kind of been hinted at, if it sells well enough, there will be another volume of The Highest House. It is, in some respects, uh, a six-issue self-contained story, but you know there is more that can be can be told, and I'm sure Mike Carey and Peter Gross will only be too willing to let us through uh, the highest house door once again. 
Coming in at our number nine slot is Jason Aaron and Ed McGuinness's The Avengers. Uh, yes, it's a new number one of an Avengers title and I can almost hear the groans being uh, thrown at me through the PC screen right now. And Generally, I would have been right there with you. The reason that I dropped Avengers so many years ago was the fact that they kept restarting these volumes of Avengers back to issue one. However, I'm a sucker for a team book and that first opening chapter of uh, a new team coming together. And that's what the great Jason Aaron did in this first issue. Uh, we have uh, kind of the disparate superhero entities uh, not even coming together in this issue but we're finding out where they all are. So we have the three mainstays of the Avengers, the kind of almost you know OGs of the team in Thor, Iron Man and Captain America. Then they throw in a couple of uh, kind of popular dare I say, a movie mainstays now of Black Panther and Doctor Strange. Uh, we get a couple of wild cards in there in the, the, um, the characters of Ghost Rider and She-Hulk. Uh, and finally, we have a character that currently seems to be being pushed to the forefront a great deal. And um, I don't know whether they knew at the time, but there's obviously the movie coming out um, in Captain Marvel. And what Jason Aaron did, what he always does, he makes it exciting. It's, it's a new dawn for the Avengers. He throws some stuff in there for long-time readers. He makes sure new readers are, are well-served and can follow the story. And so he threw in everything and made it such a ride. We've got the Celestials. We've got kind of prehistoric connections. We've got catacombs filled with alien eggs. We've got world-ending galactic threats. And it is the beginning of a big, huge blockbuster storyline. And given the, the vibrant, action-packed pacing by Ed McGuinness, this was onto a winner with me from the beginning and it's I think it's about 10 issues in now and it has been a fantastic new run of the Avengers one I know a lot of you out there have been on board with along with me Hack number eight, we've got Max Bemis and Jason Burroughs' Moon Knight, uh, specifically issue 198. And you kind of do have to wonder whether the kind of powers that be at Marvel were keeping tabs on all their titles. Uh, there was this big worry with Marvel coming under the umbrella of Disney that we were going to be deluged with a watered down version of our Marvel Universe that it was going to become very family friendly, uh, very kid friendly, the, the serious um, almost adult tone of their comic books uh, was going to be kind of drained of that life. Um, not this book, certainly not this book. Marvel Knight went through some dark and violent places this year and as I said no more so than issue 198 which kind of came in the middle of the this kind of uh, sadist cult that Moon Knight, uh, for whatever reason, uh, wanted to infiltrate and become a part of. Uh, we always have had Moon Knight dealing with the kind of psychosis, the disparate uh, kind of identities that are working in his head. Um, and what we have in issue 198 is basically the trials of Mark Spector, uh, this, this sadistic cult breaking down his body, his mind and his spirit through a number of trials. Now, while this issue did tread a very kind of adult tone, uh, Bemis was very uh, clever and adept at 
throwing in a lot of kind of irony filled humour um, and despite the depths of this kind of debauched behaviour that Mark Spector has to go through you can't help but kind of smirk at the ridiculousness, the incongruity of all the trials. Uh, that is, of course, until the final trial, uh, which would send shivers and moral conundrums uh, racing through any parent out there. Um, I would have loved to see Max Bemis do so much more on this title, but unfortunately it wasn't to be, and it finished a, a two or three issues later. Uh, but this was a fantastic addition to the Moon Knight mythology. Uh, if you get a chance, go pick up some trade uh, volumes of particularly Max Bemis's run. <laughs> At number seven, we have Rick Remender and Matteo Scalera's Black Science, issue number 36. And Image Comics is certainly Rick Remender's kind of imagination station. He's taken us on some wild rides on all the titles he puts out on that publishing imprint. Um, Black Science has been a blast this year. It's been full of adventure, dimension hopping, on always with the threat of danger at their heels. However, with issue 36, Rick Remender stripped that all back and he gave us an incredible personal story about the healing of uh, a broken marriage. Um, the, the coming to terms with each other's failings, uh, learning to forgive each other and themselves and understanding at the end of the day that life is hard but they should never give up on each other. It was an emotional snapshot made all the more magical by Matteo Scalero's art. Uh, he is he has proved that he can he can still be um, amazing at those quiet personal intimate moments and that it's not just his uh, amazing and eye candy filled panels of high octane thrilling adventure. This was a beautiful heartwarming issue uh, that would warm the cockles of anybody's heart. <laughs> Crowning off the first half of my top 10 coming in at number 6 is the most recently released issue in my top 10 and it came from Grant Morrison and Liam Sharp. It's issue number 1 of the revitalised Green Lantern and this really blew me away at the pure spectacle and expansiveness of this new era of Green Lantern. We went from the far reaches of space uh, and all its kind of crazy alien creatures and then Morrison brought us right back down to earth and the kind of human intimacy of Hal Jordan. Now while there was kind of Morrison's brand of the kind of hallucinogenic madness. Um, there were just some beautiful touches of the kind of classic superhero comic book storytelling and I enjoyed that enormously. It did take me a, a few beats to get into uh, what I like to call, and this isn't this isn't a slur, but the kind of visual chaos that is Liam Sharp's art. But but when it clicked with me, there was so much to see. My eyes scanned every inch of every panel to not miss out on the highly detailed work of Liam's. Uh, this was a title that I was very excited for what was to come. And when you have Grant Morrison at the wheel, 
you don't know what's coming. It is the unknown and it's been so, so long since a comic was able to do that to me. If you missed out or weren't sure about picking up Green Lantern, why? Go and pick up the first two issues and just dive into a wonderfully, hopefully, sci-fi epic from a great uh, comic book writer and a wonderful artist in Grant and Liam. We've reached our halfway point in my top 10 favourite comic books of 2018 and coming in at number 5 was the Marvel 2 in 1 Annual uh, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Declan Shalvey. Uh, so Zdarsky has been providing a wonderfully entertaining throwback to that kind of late Bronze Age title of the Marvel 2 in 1 uh, uh, books that used to come out back then. And I guess, and he must have had some idea, this was partly in preparation for the return of the Fantastic Four. Uh, but here in the annual Chip brought together The Thing and Doctor Doom, who is now the infamous Iron Man. And Doom was still kind of dealing with the after effects of the uh, Secret Wars event of the, um, and the battle world that he had created uh, back probably a couple of years, uh, I think now. And he was living in a world without... Um, his, I guess you'd call him his nemesis, Reed Richards. And so he was trying to find a new place for himself. And so he's kind of turned to this uh, path of, of, of the hero in some respects. And in this annual, kind of Zdarsky challenged our perce perceptions of Doom uh, and why he is the way he is through flashbacks to his youth living in Latveria. Um, and it's kind of a bit of the, the nature-nurture um, debate. Um, we're always, and, and Reed Richards and the Council of Richards, um, always kind of looking for the good in this irredeemable character, hoping that in the future uh, there will be a world that they can create without the damaging constructs that creates these dooms. It was an incredibly thought-provoking issue uh, wrapped up in uh, a nice little kind of uh, a quarter of a Fantastic Four um, kind of uh, vignette, shall we call it. Uh, a wonderful book and I am I'm happy that Zadarsky got to write this series and in some way help bring back my favourite team, the Fantastic Four. Just missing out on bronze, it's the comic book at number four, it's Matt Rosenberg and Seisman Kodransky's The Punisher. Yes, it's another issue one, but not really because Matt had literally just finished off the last volume of uh, The Punisher. Um, and we now were introduced to a new chapter in The Punisher's life where we have uh, a higher risk factor, a tougher danger. Uh, we've seen in the last volume that uh, Matt wrote, uh, Frank has been playing in the big leagues, uh, not just um, with his enemies, but he has also had the superhero community coming for his 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 literal hide at the time wearing the the war machine armor um and i was going to be incredibly disappointed if matt had taken punisher back down to dealing with you know street level crime the drug dealers uh the pimps the the mafia bosses but he didn't and i am thankful to matt for that he kept amping the danger the threat it was 
it was fantastic. Uh, as I said, Punisher now no longer has uh, this war machine armor, but his kind of taste for those big gun villains now, um, it's given him a new mission in a sense, and he's got his eyes firmly on AIM now. Uh, there is this kind of twist now. He, he was always, in some respects, um, still on that lifelong mission from the point where his family were gunned down in that park. But now it's turned into more of a redemption storyline for Frank, where his part in kind of the secret empire, he's trying to atone for basically picking the wrong side. Um, it's just as explosive, violent, blood-drenched uh, and, and ruthless as you would expect a Punisher title to be. And Kodransky with the R gives the title you know, a real down and dirty look, but with this kind of a big movie action blockbuster tone. Um, it, it's the deadly MacGyver of Marvel. It's back on top form and Matt can do no wrong with me on The Punisher right now. A long may he reign on this book. So let's kick off my top three books of 2018. Coming in at number three is Nick Spencer and Ryan Otley's The Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, this title has not been on my pull list since Dan Slott killed off Peter Parker with issue 700. And yes, I know it's another number one, but how could it not be on my list? Nick Spencer has really tapped into what makes a great Spidey title and he has taken elements of everything that was good about a Spider-Man title from years and years gone by, predating the lengthy run of Mr. Slot. Um, we've got Peter and MJ back together, just how they should be. You've got Peter having had this uh, amazingly rich, and I'm talking wealthy, lifestyle previously. He's now come right back to earth. He's down on his luck. He is that striving to meet ends meet character again. The quips are there, the witty banter, we've got the classic bad guys thrown in, Mysterio and the Lizard, just in this issue alone. We've got the secret villain scheming in the background, we've got uh, team-ups with, you know, the huge names of, of, of Marvel, and it's all wrapped up in the gorgeous comic book stylings of uh, fresh off Invincible Orion Otley, who just seems to manage to make everything super vibrant, super playful, and it, it's just a huge welcome back to uh, my pull list uh, for, for a Spidey title. I know Spectacular Spider-Man is on there, but it's all about the amazing. And if you haven't been picking this up, what's wrong with you? Right, okay, just being pipped at the post for my favorite comic book and issue of 2018. Coming in in uh, the silver place, second it is. Kill or Be Killed, issue number 20, Brubaker, Phillips and Breitweiser. Um, instead of a first issue, it's a last one. Yes, this was the last issue of uh, the latest stellar run uh, for this crime noir trio. And I know some people were kind of disappointed how this end ended, but what I loved about it, that it kind of... It challenged that old adage that you can please some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all of the time. So what did Brubaker give us? Um, in issue um, 19, he gave us a huge cliffhanger, our main character being shot, potentially mortally wounded, 
And he gave us two scenarios of how the story could or should have ended. So whether you wanted him to die or whether you wanted him to live, you got your story. So what if Dylan had lived? Well, did he get his happily ever after? Did he continue his vigilantism? Um, did he live happily ever after with his his girlfriend Kira? Um, and should he have given the the violence and the evil that had overwhelmed him? But what if Dylan had died? How did that affect the people who were left behind? Um, without spoiling, I guess, too much uh, of the story, if you were interested in picking this up in trade, and I highly re recommend you do. Um, I don't know if the demon's existence was ever proven or disproven, um, or the way that Brubaker ends it is it a case of this demon is in all of us and it's just uh, the person's willingness or choice to listen to literally the demons in your head. Uh, Sean and Elizabeth have rocked the art in this book from the very beginning uh, and throughout right up till the end some beautifully drawn, beautifully coloured panels. Um, it was a breathtaking series. If you watch any of my previous videos, you will have always heard me say, I can't believe how much better the latest series is by this trio than the last. You don't think they can reach any higher heights. And then they do. And here we are. It is the reveal of my number one top comic of 2018. Have you guessed what it is yet? If you're a loyal and supportive member of my channel, you may have already realised that the number one slot could only go to Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino's Gideon Falls. Fully recommended, 100% guaranteed that this is a corker. I could have, I mean, Jeff Lemire has put out so much stuff this year um, and I could have gone the very personal, emotional, um, kind of heartbreaking route with Royal City, but with the added joy of Sorrentino on art, this was a no-brainer to make it to my number one slot. A Gideon Falls has psychological horror at its best. It's creepy, it's claustrophobic, it's so intense in parts. And this is issue six, it kind of rounded off the 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 latest story arc before it took a hiatus, a short hiatus. It's back now, back as good as ever. And when you leave us like that, uh, and we know you're going to take a couple of months off, you better leave us with a humdinger of a cliffhanger. And Jeff Lemire delivered and flipped the whole narrative of this tale on its head had me confused in a thoroughly um, positive way. Um, it really managed to push all our characters. Um, it kind of gave more to some of their backstories, uh, their pathway to where they are now. And let's just put it out there. No one breaks down panels explodes the page construct like Sorrentino. He, his work just kind of adds another layer and then another layer and then another layer to the kind of chaotic fear of this book um, as our, our priest of the story kind of enters into the red barn and the way it, it changes him, the, the, the revelation, the reveal of, 
and I, t I just don't want to spoil it because this book needs to be read, it needs to be supported a hundred percent as I said this book will not disappoint you. I would find it very hard to find out someone who disliked it um, enough not to read it because I just thought it was a, a fantastic and still is a thrilling ride that Lemire is is doing a wonderful job on this. Uh, I have no clue whether this is an ongoing or Jeff Lemire has a point of ending. He usually does uh, and this story will be told and it will be told adeptly and uh, as, as succinctly as Lemire likes to provide his readership. Just a fantastic overall product uh, from the Image Comics stable and uh, from two greats of the medium right now. And there we have it folks. That was my top 10 favourite comic books of 2018. Thank you all for watching once again. Please let me know what books would have been on your top 10 down in the comments section below. Uh, give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe if you're not already. There are a number of videos still to come this week for Christmas. And then we will see what happens in 2019. Thank you all for watching. I will speak to you soon. Bye-bye.